Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, September 20th. Today's topic is the Global Read Aloud 2014. I'm one of the show hosts, Lori Moffat, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. Thank you to Tammy for doing closed captioning for us. Our special guest is Pernil Rip, and we have a, a someone to introduce Pernil to us. Uh, Paula Noggle will do the introduction, and then we'll go backwards to the newbie question slide. Good morning, everyone. This is Paula Noggle, or I should say good day wherever you're located. Um, let me get started with Purnell's introduction. I first met Purnell online back in 2010. One of our first connections came about because of one of her students. Connor had come up with the idea to sponsor a Christmas Glogster Challenge, and I read about it on her blog titled, Blogging Through the Fourth Dimension. I had nine students who entered Connor's challenge, and I was thrilled when I saw a tweet saying one of my students, Helen, had won the challenge. Like thousands of other educators, I became an avid follower of Pernille on Twitter and have been a faithful reader of her blog. I had the honor of meeting Pernell face to face last year at the BAMI Awards in Washington, D.C., where she was a finalist for the elementary school teachers category. I was amazed that this person, who seems so outspoken through her blog, is really a rather shy and very humble person in real life. I thoroughly enjoyed every minute I got to spend with her and her wonderful husband that weekend. By the way, Purnell is a BAMI Award finalist again this year. I wish her luck next weekend when the winners will be announced. Purnell lives in Madison, Wisconsin and has taught 4th, 5th, and 7th grade and is known to say things like, I have no awards or accolades except for the light bulbs that go off in my student's head every day. She likes to describe herself as a proud techie geek and mass consumer of incredible books. Speaking of books, her first book, The Passionate Learner, giving, out, <clears throat> giving Our Classrooms Back to Our Students Starting Today, was recently published by the Powerful Learning Press. And her second book, Empowered Schools, Empowered Students, Creating Connected and Invested Learners, is out now from Corwin Press. Even though she is a wife, mother of four, and an incredible teacher, she finds time to be a co-founder and an organizer of EdCamp Madwin, which is Madison, Wisconsin, and a host of the phenomenally successful Global Read Aloud Project, which she is here to share with us today. It is an honor for me to be able to introduce to all of you my friend, the fabulous Pernille Rip. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, I actually got a little teary-eyed because it's so important to me when I meet people face to face that it was, um, I saw you sitting there in the lobby last year and I knew who you were right away because you look so much like your profile picture, but it was really hard for me to go up and say, hey, I'm Pernille Rip, I don't know if you know me, and you just lit up in this big smile and said, of course I know you. So thank you so much for the beautiful introduction. And uh, I don't know how <laughs> I do it either, but I find the time to do it. Um, but you know, we always say balance is like a unicorn, it's somewhere in Africa, but um, we do try to keep it balanced here at my house. So the newbie question is, why is reading aloud to students important? I would love for either you to take the mic or to add your um, comments in uh, the chat box. So I'm going to stop talking and just kind of let other people um, chime in on why is reading aloud to students important. Anyone? I love those reasons down in the chat. You're absolutely right. And uh, there's so much research out there that supports a read aloud. And even in, in the older grades with students, even in high school, reading aloud to students. And so I wish that it was because of the research that I had started the Global Read Aloud, but it truly isn't. So. 
Um, keep, keep questions coming. I'll kind of go through some things, but seriously interrupt any time that you want. So let's see. Um, so that's me in case you don't know what I look like. I think I looked like this a couple of kids ago, but I like using this picture because I pretty much look pretty much the same, but we do have a new house, so that log house has been torn down since then. But the Global Read Aloud really started with a dream, or more importantly, it actually started with Neil Gaiman. I am a huge, huge um, fan of NPR, and my husband and I were driving in the car one day, and we were listening to NPR and they were talking about the One Book, One World project that was happening with the read, read, shared reading of Neil Gaiman's American Gods. And because I'm such a huge fan, I kind of turned it up and tuned in. And if you don't know what the One Book, One World project was, it was in 2010 and it was just kind of this huge global book club where they were using Twitter and they were using a hashtag to um, share their experiences with the book. And I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. Um, I had just gotten on Twitter myself. I just started blogging. I, that all kind of started in June of 2010. And I turned to my husband and I said, wouldn't it be cool if you could do that with kids? And, uh, and he goes, yeah, you should. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. And so I, I kind of mulled about it, my, like my blog. I think this was like the second month of my blog being alive. And um, I thought about it a little bit. And then I sent out a tweet. And I think I had about 30 people following me at that point. But that didn't stop me because I was just kind of like, let's see where this goes. And so this was actually the first tweet. And, uh, and how about a global read aloud with a tied in wiki? Because that's as far as I <laughs> had gotten. It was just, let's share a book and then have somewhere to share. And I really didn't know much about wikis. I didn't really know much about sharing. But I had read about wikis. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. And, um, and so the response was kind of immediate. And that was um, really surprising to me. And right away people said, that's great. Let's do it. Where do we sign up and what are we doing? And I thought to myself, uh oh, what did I just get myself into? Because I had not thought this through. I didn't really think that people would respond right away. But I think some of our best ideas come from when we just do things. And so the Global Read Aloud truly, truly, truly was just an idea uh, in my head. And I had no idea how to do anything. So that's how I felt. Like, what did I just do? What did I just say yes to? And I think we feel like that a lot of the time in our classrooms. Um, and I think a lot of people who sign up for the Global Read Aloud are like, this is a great idea, but what did I just do? What did I just say yes to? So I always tell the story of how the Global Read Aloud started because it truly started as um, an organic idea that has just grown every year. And when people <laughs> say, um, well, uh, where's it going? And what's the vision? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, we're here to share a read aloud. And, and that's always the main thing for me. And so whenever I talk to people, uh, some people I have to kind of talk off the ledge because they feel overwhelmed. They feel like they should be doing a lot of things, but that's really not what the Global Read Aloud is about. Um, the Global Read Aloud is about you sharing a read aloud with your students or your grandkids or, or whomever you want to share with, and then um, somehow connecting with others. And I think sometimes we forget that a connection can even be with a classroom next door. Uh, those connections matter just as much as our global connections. Or if the students go home and share their experience with their parents, they're connecting through this book too. So if you're a brand new person and you're kind of freaking out about technology, don't. Because it's not so much about the technology and what you can use it for, but it is much more about um, you know, all the connections that we can make with people. So, uh, this was me. What did I just do? And it's still me. Every year as the project <laughs> gets larger and larger and I get more and more emails and more and more questions and more and more ideas, um, I, every year I go, what, what are we doing? And every year we figure it out. So the first thing, of course, if you haven't been to the website, uh, globalreadaloud.com, that's our home. It's a terrible website and I do apologize. One of my projects for this winter is to revamp it and make it much more user friendly. Um, it needs to be turned into an actual website and not a blog so that people can find the information that they need. But it is always a great place to start and especially the frequently asked questions. Um, and I actually need to update the screenshot because it's a really old screenshot and it doesn't quite look like that anymore. 
also the website gives you a direct link to me on the side of it. There's a way to contact me. So if you have any questions, you can just get me right through there. Um, so we have a home. That was where I started. And, uh, and like I said, this project has grown through uh, you know, people simply spreading the word. And, um, and I think that, was, that has shown the power and the passion between it too, is that that first year we did it. So we read the Little Prince Aloud. Um, and we only had one book. We had about 600 students um, that participated globally, which was really mind-blowingly amazing to me. Um, and then the year after, we had about 6,000, and then 30,000, and then 144,000. So I think the power of the project lies in the participants. So I know that people always say, well, yeah, I created it. And that's true. I did create it. But the growth of it is really all the people that are in it. So answers. A lot of people are looking for answers. And the most common one is always, what should I be doing? And so I always tell people, Figure out which book you want to do. And this year we have K through 12. So there's an author study studying the phenomenal um, Peter H. Reynolds, who will be involved with the project. And if you're doing the picture book study, there's uh, a picture book for each week, except for the last week where it's your choice. And you use those as a way to connect with others. And I know that there's a lot are of K and first graders doing that. But there's also a lot of older classes doing it because, again, the power of picture books cannot be um, denied um, even for our older students. And Peter has been incredibly supportive of the project and is really excited. And he even said, you know, if, if people want to order the books, he has a bookstore um, in Massachusetts called the Blue Bunny Books. And if people order them and let them know that they're in for the Global Read Aloud, there might be something special in there, which is so cool. And I actually want to order books through there. So he's really excited about it. Um, then we have The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane, a phenomenal book by Kate DiCamillo. She's aware of the project, but being National Book Ambassador, she's just simply too busy. And again, that book spans across a lot of grade levels as well. But it's centered more around second, third, fourth. Then we have the brand new book by Jenny Holm, um, The Fourteenth Goldfish, which I have absolutely loved. I was lucky enough to get an advanced copy because Colby Sharp from the Nerdy Book Club said, Pernille, have you read it? You should look at it for the Global Read Aloud. And I did. Jenny will be a part of the project. She just did a huge book giveaway for us on the book birthday where she gave um, 15 hardcover copies and five audiobooks away from the book. And she's really excited about it. And I love the science connection with the 14 goldfish and the whole uh, essential question of do, do we want to live forever? And, uh, and what would eternal youth look like? And I think also that book lends itself well um, <clears throat> to older classes too. So I noticed before, you know, how do you do it if you're teaching chemistry? Well, here's a book that maybe you could use somehow um, because it does actually bring up a lot of science. Uh, the next book that we're doing this year is One for the Murphys by Linda Mullaly Hunt, which uh, if you have not read this book, it is such a powerful um, book uh, about family and about finding love and figuring out where you fit in and navigating your life. And Linda, Linda is uh, also going to be a part of the project. She just released a blog post talking about all the amazing things she's doing as part of the project. And uh, when I read her blog post, I was at Target sitting in the parking lot, and I actually started crying because um, she has really just embraced the project and has made it her own and is just doing so much for all of the people that are sharing her book. Um, Final book then is The Fault in Our Stars, which also was a runner-up last year. John Green, man, I can't nail him down. I don't think anybody can. That book is just too big and with the movie success and everything. So it'd be cool. I don't even know if he knows about the project. but um, So that is for more of a high school-oriented uh, audience, obviously. And uh, I think the big theme for all of the books this year is just acceptance and love and figuring out where we fit in the world. And I think that that's so important. Um, so I pretend that every year I pick a book based on a theme, but I really don't. I spend all year reading great books, and then I sit and I think, can I talk to my own students about these books? And would a child somewhere other than Oregon, Wisconsin, where I teach, would another child be able to relate to this book, or would it be completely, um, completely foreign to them? So. Um, 
So the answers, um, when people say, okay, what do I do? I say, pick your book. So that was kind of the books. And then I say, it's a great idea to get on a moto. Some people are on school, schoolologies. I think that's how you pronounce it, which is great as well. But um, Edmodo for me has always been the gathering place for the Global Read Aloud because if you can do Facebook, you can do Edmodo. And um, I think that helps people uh, get into Edmodo. There's groups set up for each project or for each segment of the project. And it's a great place for teachers to share. Now some people choose then to connect through Edmodo through their students um, putting them on there. And others don't. And that's completely, completely fine. Um, Edmodo works really, really well right now for finding connections with other uh, teachers, classrooms, setting up minor groups, but also sharing ideas. And I've, I've loved the conversation, particularly in the last week, where people have started talking about um, how are you going to kick it off, and, and here are ideas. And, um, and yeah, like Paula just threw up the uh, fourth grade classes reading the 14th goldfish. There's certain group codes that people are putting up. And it's just a great place to not feel so alone. And I love when people post and say, oh, I'm, I'm brand new. I have no clue what I'm doing. Can somebody please take me under the wing? And right away I see replies from veter veterans going, yes, I'll help you. Or even newbies going, you know what, I don't either. Um, let's do it together. Kathy, uh, or I'm sorry, Diane, the 14th goal fish okay for second graders? I would say so. There isn't a whole lot of mature stuff in it. Um, I don't know how much they would relate to it. Paula, I don't know if you want to chime in. I can stop talking for a second if you want to chime in. What do you think for a second grade? I'm sorry. I was typing and missed the question for Nell. Do you think that the 14th goldfish would be okay for second graders? Um, the readability would be a little high, but is it, since it's a read aloud project, I think they would love it. The story is absolutely wonderful, and I also love the tie-in to um, science and from a girl's perspective and famous scientists and all of that. Just absolutely loved it. Thank you, Paula. Yeah, and I think. I always tell people it's probably a good idea to read the books. And I love discovering books along with my students when I'm reading them aloud. But for this, because we perp I purposely pick books that sometimes have a heavier theme, such as one for the Murphys or Fault in Our Stars, um, I, I really recommend reading it before you do it as a read aloud so that you don't all of a sudden find yourself in an, in an uncomfortable position if the, if the subject matter is too heavy for your students. Like in one for the Murphys, um, there's abuse and or there was abuse and, and so she is, she's detailing that and it, it really, it does propel the story forward and it's um, it's going to open up some really deep conversations but you know I wouldn't read one for the Murphy with a fourth grade class for example. My fifth graders last year would have been able to handle it but it's kind of like, like that finding that perfect book that will fit your purpose too. So looking for connections, this is you know a screenshot of someone looking for connections in Edmodo obviously. Um, and so this is this is Pretty much what people do. This is my first year participating. Here's where I am. Here's how I'd like to connect. And as you can see here, Edmodo and Skype. And when people, new newbies in particular, um, start talking about um, well, what's the best way if I just want to connect in one way, what's the best way I can do it? I always say Skype because it is absolutely, absolutely so easy. If you're if that or Google Hangout. Um, I think also Skype and meeting another classroom face to face through video is so powerful for the students because we can kind of get an image in our heads about what other kids are responding to and reacting through the way that they're writing back to us through blogs or Twitter or Edmodo, but then actually having a real life conversation and sharing ideas and thoughts, knowing that they're somewhere somewhere else living a different life than you, that's when it really clicks for my students. Um, so Skype, yes, is a great way to really bring, bring in the connections. So what I love about the Global Read Aloud too is that all, often the connections don't end after the project ends. It starts October 6th, runs through November 14th, unless you're running behind, which is totally okay. Um, but 
figuring out how to continue the connecting and coming up with new projects. And this happens every single year. There's always some people that band together in the spring and they do another uh, kind of global read aloud-ish project and, um, and other classrooms that just continue the connecting. So don't feel like um, that the dates mean that, okay, November 14th came and, and now you're going to cut off yourself from the rest of the world. Like, use those connections, use those groups, those that motor groups always stay up, the official ones for the project, and people use them throughout the year looking for other resources. So I do try to provide some sort of connection safety net for newbies in particular, um, but also for veterans of finding other things to collaborate through. So you can use Global Read Aloud as a vessel for further global collaboration, which I love. So, and it's really in that cocoon of safety um, because you don't, you know, it's moderated. Edmodo is moderated by me, so if anything weird comes up, I kick people out of the group. I think it happens once every year where a student randomly makes their way in and posts something stupid. But I think also it's a way, since you've had, had this initial connection through a, an actual project, you know that it's a real class that you're connecting with. It, um, it's a real educator that you're sitting and sharing your students with. And I think that's really important, particularly if this is one of the first global collaborative projects that you're doing in your school and not a lot of people have done it before. I think it's really important that we can go to administration and parents and say, this is how my students are safe. This is the purpose of it. And yes, it fits into common core and standards and district missions and all this, but also all of these kids are going to be connecting in a safe manner. And so that for me has always been really, really important that um, they all feel like it's something they can get behind and, and allow their kids to be a part of. We do run into every year that certain technologies don't work for certain people, but then again, that's where Edmodo is so great because there's usually somebody else out there that kind of is working under the same restrictions or only has that one way that they can connect with you. So if you signed up, you found someone to connect with, people are always like, well, now what? Well, it's really up to you guys. And I love that that's, that's what it is because um, in the beginning of the first year, I, I thought, should I create a lesson plan? Should I give people more ideas? And then I realized that that's not the spirit of the project because we all do read alouds differently and we're all looking for different ways to fit it into our curriculum. So I always use the read aloud as my mentor text. And that's important for me because if I don't do that, then I can't do it with my seventh graders. And so share ideas, yes, but there will never be an official, this is how you're supposed to use this. It's truly, truly about making it your own and making it work for you in the classroom. Um, so obviously the kickoff is October 6th, and honestly, I kick it off in probably the lamest way possible. I simply start reading aloud. Um, Dali, Dali, I can't read your name, Dalila, I hope I didn't mispronounce that. Uh, yes, I hope so. We have to nail something down as far as Peter Reynolds um, for like a Google type hangout or something like that where people can dial in like we did last year with Sharon Draper where, where it was recorded and people could also watch live and submit questions through Twitter. That's what I'm hoping to do with Peter. I just need to nail it down. We'll see. But yeah, something, something. Um, so do not feel like you need to have all the answers and do bring in the strangers and then by that I mean post your questions. Uh, post your questions in Edmodo if you're on Twitter and you feel comfortable with that, post it there. Post it on Facebook. We have a Facebook group too for those of you who want to uh, connect through there. Ask questions. There's no such thing as a stupid question when it comes to this. Um, I do try to make it as user friendly as possible, but everybody's at various levels and stages. And so if I don't get to your question, for example, on Edmodo, I've noticed that a lot of the veterans do, and that's why it's so amazing. So different ideas. Edmodo is a great place to get ideas. Twitter is a great place to get ideas. Also, if you look under press on the globalreadaloud.com or frequently asked questions, or there's links to blog posts of what people have done in their classroom. But truly, your idea has worth. So whatever you're thinking you're going to do, 
please do it because that's what makes this project so uh, amazing is that everybody takes it and fits it into their own box and shapes it the way they, they want to. So like last year, my class decided after we read uh, Out of My Mind by Sharon Draper, they said, well, what we really want to do a school-wide PSA campaign to stop the R word. And so they did. And it wasn't like that was a global read-aloud thing. That was just my students saying, this is how we want to bring this into, this is our service project that we're going to do. And so every year I plan certain things, but every year too I want to see, okay, what is this inspiring the kids to do? And I think that that's important. And there's so many crazy ideas out there. And this is like how TACK got involved, T-A-C-K-K, -K, got involved last year because people were using them. And so they contacted me and said, hey, we found out about your project. Can we help out in any way? And I kind of had to tell, tell them, you know, we don't have official things that we do. I don't say here's the official tool of the Global Read Aloud. Um, but I said, sure, if you want to make templates for people. And if you don't know what TAC is, it's like a website creator for kids. And it's phenomenal. And it's super easy. And they've gotten gung-ho on board. And there's all these templates now already um, that you can use where students can showcase their thoughts. And so, you know, partnerships like that do arise. We partner with Skype, obviously, too. I'm a master teacher for Skype. But that's not because Skype is the official tool, but that's because Skype is what I use. And they have been phenomenal as far as just trying to make it work for people using Skype and bringing authors in and, and brainstorming how we best can do that. I think thing links, I think there are thing links out there. There's so much stuff out there I have a hard time keeping up. I'm working on a big collaborative document where people are simply sharing ideas and I will throw that up somewhere. So this year, the number as of this morning at 7 a.m. is 269,443 students signed up, uh, about 4,700 facilitators in more than 50 different countries. So when people talk about, is this truly global, yes, it absolutely is. Um, um, I, we have all 50 states. I think the only continent we don't have is Antarctica. And every day when, I don't look every day, I should say that, every couple of days when I go in and look at our connection sheet and see that number growing, I simply cannot believe that this many people are doing the global read aloud. So, don't feel like you must be the only one with that crazy question, or don't feel like you're the only one looking for a connection. People are still signing up. There are still people that haven't started preparing. There are still people that haven't started planning. There are still people looking for connections. There are so many of you out there um, that there is someone waiting for you to get connected. I have not connected with anyone yet because I've been too busy. And um, I will be talking to my students next week about which books they want to do because they're going to choose. I, I think I have five different sections of seventh graders, and I'm truly hoping that they'll pick different things. Not that I don't like re um, reading the same book aloud, but it might get a little confusing. So. Who knows where the project will go, but that is crazy to me. That's 130,000, more than, no, I'm sorry, 126,000 more than uh, joined last year. And so who knows where this project will go, but you are definitely part of a global collaboration. Um, yes, we should get the scientists on Antarctica involved in the GRA. I should, I should work on that. New for this year is the Share a Book initiative. And that was because of a surprise package I got at my old school with a picture book in it from South Africa. And in it, uh, Karen, um, oh, now I can't remember her name. I always feel terrible because she's a friend of mine. This is called Sleep Deprivation When You Have Four Children. Um, she sent me a, a book that they had done and, and thanked me for the Global Read Aloud. And I realized how powerful that was. Because um, all of a sudden, my students were learning about their part of the world through this picture book because it was a picture book that showcased their part of the world. And I ended up reading it to my fifth graders who loved it. And then I took it down to our first grade buddies who thought it was crazy. And then I took it into kindergarten. So I was kind of popping around. And I ended up giving it to my librarian and, and say, you know, you should share this with some people because this is just crazy. This is so crazy. So one book from another part of the world started these uh, deep conversations about what it must be like to be a student there or a child growing up there. So this year, it's voluntary. You don't have to do it. But we're calling it the Share a Book Initiative. And we are hoping that people who are connecting 
will find a picture book or a chapter book that somehow represents their area. And they can even make one if the students want to make a book. And then they send it to their connections. Um, so it kind of adds a layer of connections to it, but also just, again, broadens that global understanding of what it means to be a child somewhere else other than where we're growing up. So um, it's, like I said, it's voluntary. You don't have to do it because I don't ever want to tell people, well, you have to do this to be a part of the project. The project is free. It will probably always be free. Uh, so it, it is what it is, but um, the Share a Book initiative I'm really, really excited about, and I hope people do it because how cool would it be for all of those kids to get books from other parts of the world. Um, so for me, I always ask people, what is your passion? What is it that you're hoping to get out of this project? Um, what is it that you want it to accomplish? For me, it's always twofold. I want my students to be sucked into the great uh, story that I'm going to be sharing with them, and then I want them to connect with others. And whichever way we do that, it has to work with what we're doing and how we're doing it, because I don't have time to all of a sudden create a whole new thing in my classroom. So find your passion, figure out how you want to connect, and, um, and then go with that way. You also have to have a little bit of belief in this. And then you've got to be just a little bit uh, courageous and just try it, particularly if you are new. You know, really just tell yourself that, yes, you can do it. Because every year, newbies have done it. And even if you just read the book aloud and you don't connect with anyone, but you kind of keep an eye on it, you're still part of something bigger. There is no wrong way to do this project, except for maybe not reading it aloud. I think that would be bad. <laughs> Because you're not alone, and you're not alone with all of the thoughts or doubts you have, or even all the crazy, amazing ideas you have for this type of project. And even if you're thinking right now, well, I'm not in the classroom yet, or this won't work for my classroom, steal the idea of using a read aloud to connect with others. Maybe October 6th doesn't work out for you, so maybe you want to look for someone to do something in December. Or maybe you need to work under a certain book because that's what your district has mandated. So there are so many people out there just waiting to connect. And I think that that's, what's, that's what grows the Global Read Aloud every year, that this is exactly what people were waiting for. And so it, it truly is just that you're not alone in this world. There's so many teachers out there looking to connect their students, whether it's through a Read Aloud or whether it's through some other type of collaborative project. What we need to do for our students is be the facilitator of that connection. So we have to push ourselves out of our comfort zone and put our toes in and say, OK, you know what, I believe that we can make a difference by connecting with others. We can bring the world in and show my kids that their voice matters and that they have an authentic audience. But to do all that, we have to be the ones to take the first step. So build your community in whichever way you can, whether you feel comfortable building it on Facebook or through Twitter or through, you know, obviously the Classroom Live community is huge. Um, so build your community and ask people, hey, I'm thinking about doing this crazy idea. Does anyone want to do it? That's how Dot Day started. And there was a million and a half kids doing it, you know, on Monday or this week. So dream a little. Don't, don't let your fear stop you. If I had thought about where the global read aloud would, would end up, I would never have done it. I am so thankful that I was completely blind to what this project would pan out to be. I had an idea. I went for it. And that was really all that I wanted to do. You have to let go of your own fears because we, our fears stand in the way of what our students can achieve and what our students can dream, and also what we can achieve. We forget that we are students ourselves and that these connections enrich our lives too, not just the lives of our students. So if you get a chance, take it. And if it changes your life, you've got to let it. And I think that's so important when we talk about what we can do as educators. Catherine Applegate is the reason authors are involved in the project. The first two years, no one, no author was involved. And um, she was the one that found the project. And she contacted me and said, I, I see you picked the one and only Ivan. This is pre-Newberry. This is right when Ivan came out. And she said, do you mind if I'm part of it? And I went, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Of course you can be. And she ended up really adopting the project and tweeting us. And then she ended up making this big video. And she did some Skype calls into classrooms. And she promoted the project. And so I asked her, I said, how did it feel? And this is what she said um, in, the, in her own words of what it was. And it's because of Catherine Applegate that ever since then, 
we have uh, connected with authors as much as possible and brought them in. Last year, Kate Messner was absolutely incredible. Sharon Draper was incredible. Jeff Herbach was incredible. So we try to bring in that dimension. So for me, it's always, <clears throat> you know, what are you waiting for? Even if you're like, oh, global read aloud won't work for me. Well, what global collaborative project will work for you? What are you going to do to push your kids out of that comfort zone? So that's about it for, for the official part and some links. And I know that they have tons of links, too. So I'm going to stop talking. <laughs>
And then one of the activities that we did with my morning class was that we were able to Skype with an author. And that particular author was um, uh, Lori Ann Thompson, who has, her book just came out, I believe, that day. And it's uh, a little bit beyond uh, some of our kids' expectations or reading levels. But again, it would be a great uh, share aloud, uh, read aloud. And unfortunately, I don't remember the title exactly, but this was her contact information. And how did I get in touch with her? I was doing um, a chat on Twitter that happened to be about Dot Day. And the next day, of, um, Terry Shea, who's a big uh, part of the Dot Day community, sent out a tweet that she was looking for classes to Skype with. So of course I started following her. She followed me back. I sent her a regular tweet. And she said, sure, she'd love to. Then we, because we were following each other, we were able to DM, uh, which is direct message each other on Twitter. And we set up our time and our collaboration. And I explained to her that I would have my fourth graders and a pre-K class in my classroom. And she absolutely loved it. The kids were cute as could be. I mean, my fourth graders are absolutely awesome, but there's nothing more wonderful than to see a four-year-old um, sitting in front of a webcam talking to an author in California and, and showing, holding up their shoes to the webcam so that the author could see her new pink shoes. Then on Wednesday afternoon, <clears throat> I was able to Skype with Mrs. P online. I don't know if any of you um, have discovered her. I actually didn't find her until last year. She does, uh, she's an act, she's the actress Kathy Kinney. And she does uh, YouTube videos on storytelling. And I have played lots of her videos for my kids to listen to. She's absolutely wonderful. And we had, of course, what would have happened? Wednesday afternoon was the day that our technology, our Wi-Fi, decided to get very, very glitchy. So I had changed connections several times. I finally did it on my own uh, MacBook. It was the only way that we could actually kind of understand her. And then my kids shared all sorts of wonderful things with her. And again, how did I make that connection? She joined a uh, dot day chat that we were having and said she'd love to Skype with my class. So being on Twitter is awesome. Thanks so much, Paula, for sharing that. If you're looking for authors to Skype with, if you Google um, Kate Messner, authors who Skype, um, you'll get a whole Google Doc of authors that will Skype with you. And a lot of them will do it for free. Or like someone like Kirby Larson, who's such a phenomenal writer, she does like a limited amount of Skypes. But if you get in quick enough, you could be one of them. And so don't be afraid to even, I've even had kids just talk to authors like Ann Urso, who wrote The Real Boy. They were reading it for a book club. And they were just writing back and forth to her on Twitter. And it was, it was crazy powerful for those kids that they could ask and really come up with some deep questions that even she was impressed with. And so I think, like Paula said, one of the reasons why she's a connected educator is because it connects her, her, her kids. And I think that that's so important because that's why I'm a connect, connected educator, because it allows my students to be connected. That's great. Does anyone else want to share? If so, you can raise your hand and we can give you the mic that way. Use that little hand button up near your name. Or you can type in the chat. We've seen some in the chat already today. All right, if not, then oh, when connecting with other classes, do you re recommend a guided question? What's the best way to get the conversation going? 
for us, um, what has worked well is just if the teachers do a little bit of planning of what are we going to be talking about, and then I prep my students beforehand so that we have a couple of questions. But then also allow for some flexibility as far as if the conversation takes a certain direction. Sometimes mm -hmm. we've even just done the shared read aloud. So where one teacher reads aloud for a little bit, and then we have like a, a live conversation right then. And sometimes it's great, and sometimes it's it's not great, <laughs> um, just like they are in our classroom. So we can sure. do, we can kind of do different things with it. Terrific. Okay, that I think was the last question in chat that I saw. We'll go ahead and wrap up for today. These are the upcoming shows for Classroom 2.0 Live. September 27th is Kathy Cassidy. She's our featured teacher for September. October 4th is an open mic digital storytelling with Wes Fryer. He's going to be the panel facilitator for that, that session. October 11th would be the, 11th, the October featured teacher who hasn't been chosen yet. October 18th, Twitter chats, what, why, how, and when with Alice Keeler. October 25th, there isn't a show because of the DEN Streamathon Virtual Conference. November 8th, the featured teachers Jamie Reynolds, and November 15th, edweb.net for PD, Lisa Schmucky, and an educator panel. So lots of terrific shows coming up. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargandon's newest endeavor. He's grouped together all of his uh, education PD development resources all in one place, including the host your own webinar. You can host your own Blackboard Collaborate classroom webinar as long as you make the room public when you do that. You can nominate a featured teacher, like the one coming up in October, by filling out a form at tinyurl.com slash CR20 Live Featured Teacher Nominate without the E at the end. And you can even nominate, nominate yourself as a featured teacher. As you exit the session, your browser should open up the Classroom 2.0 Live survey. And if it doesn't, it will be in the chat box or the chat log that's posted on the website. Or it's also in the live binder. Um, when you complete the survey, at the end you'll find uh, fields to request a professional development certificate. And um, please, if you do that, make sure that your request goes to a personal email address rather than a school email address because a lot of schools will block this email from reaching you. And this, this has been updated. Now it actually prints out your name under the uh, certificate of participation on that top line. The recordings are available at iTunes U, both a video collection and an audio collection, to listen to or watch with a mobile Apple device. The recordings are also avail available uh, by RSS feed in a feed reader. You can get to the archives that way. So there are numerous ways to get to the archives. This particular page shows you the link to the full classroom recording or this, this recording once it's published. There are other options as well to watch or listen to archives. Special thanks today to Pratinal Rip for being our guest, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing our website, and to everyone who participated in today's show. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Paula, I see your hand is up. I just wanted to take a moment and say personally a huge thank you to Purnell for taking time out of her 
extremely busy schedule to join us here today and I cannot wait to get started as I'm sure everybody in this room and all of the thousands of other participants are looking so forward to the Global Read Aloud. Thank you so much, Pernille. Thank you for believing in the project and thank you for inviting me today. Um, I may have started it, but I'm not the reason it's great. All of the participants and all the kids are. And so I just can't wait to see all those connections being made this year and uh, see how we're going to bring the world in and, and really connect the world. So thank you so much. <laughs>